Yes, hello everybody. I'm very happy to welcome you all to our first session in, in panel five. Um, and I hope you can all um, uh, hear us well and see us well. So um, I'd like to introduce you at first to, to our three speakers, which are online, which you can see now. Um, uh, Martin Jacob will start. Um, uh, he will be the, the first speaker, um, followed, by, um, followed by Carrie. She will be the second. Um, and Iska will be the third. And we hope that um, Ricardo is going to join us uh, during the session as well. Um, so um, I'd, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce. Uh, I'd like to um, also introduce um, our uh, co-host, this is Markus Fritz from Fraunhofer Easy, who will be uh, present in the session too. And uh, Cedric, he's um, also with us here this afternoon. Um, so just for um, for some technical stuff, Marty will start with this first presentation. Uh, we will see the video, and then you have the the chance to to raise your questions. We have a short discussion um, uh, in uh, directly after the presentation, and then we will start to the next presentation and have the Q and A afterwards as well. So yes. I'm really looking forward um, to, to your speech, Mark, uh, Martin. Um, Martin is going to um, start with a, with a bunch of questions cities really have to answer in these times uh, regarding energy transition goals. So um, how much will it cost? Who is of need and how to align uh, with municipal development needs and goals? Um, yeah, we are really keen to your presentation, Martin. Please, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, my name is Martin Jacob. Uh, I'm uh, from the company TEP Energy based in Zurich. And I will try to uh, sketch uh, together with you on how to achieve uh, energy goals and climate uh, goals in cities uh, following an integrative, uh, multidisciplinary and evidence-based uh, approach that involves uh, different uh, actors that are uh, typically uh, concerned in such a, a transformation process. context where we are, um, cities and municipalities uh, increasingly seek to uh, increase energy efficiency, reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, they should reduce them to zero, by the way, uh, and also to mitigate local air pollution. And um, given these goals and um, the fact that uh, complexity has been increased in terms of regulation, uh, this uh, transformation is a quite a tremendous uh, challenge, not only on the physical uh, level, but also on the institutional uh, level where uh, actors and uh, departments are often uh, pursuing their task individually only uh, and not um, um, working together and seeing the, the different uh, connections uh, across uh, each other. Uh, so what are the typical questions and challenges? related to this uh, transformation of the basically the energy sector. Uh, so the question is, how can we reach ambitious and uh, climate uh, related goals and at which costs and benefits we can do that? Uh, is there an optimal path? Uh, how can we develop uh, urban energy and climate plans uh, while still meeting also different uh, other goals such as uh, urban development, for instance? Uh, how can we balance energy efficiency, and we are here in a conference of energy efficiency, uh, but uh, at the same time, we know that energy efficiency only is not sufficient. It's a, a prerequisite maybe, and how can we balance that with local energy potentials? Basically, thermal energy needs to be tapped uh, somehow or brought into the building sector uh, by certain means. Uh, so this is a specific challenge we are facing with. And in relation to that, what is the role of uh, actually grids, uh, thermal grids, gas grids uh, in such a, a transformation process and which of uh, the different um, potential solutions uh, such as grids or individual uh, building solutions uh, are cost effective to tap uh, renewable energy potentials. Uh, so the key barriers um, we are um, facing against uh, implementing um, climate change transformation in the built environment in cities 
is, uh, as I mentioned uh, previously, the challenge that um, different um, actors, they, um, they go individually, independently uh, in their daily work. And um, the, the instruments they are using are lacking of interdisciplinary uh, approaches. And uh, when it then would come to implementation, uh, there is often a lack of coherent and transparent uh, data sets uh, that would allow uh, for an evidence-based uh, uh, implementation. <clears throat> Uh, so, uh, basically, we have um, two levels that we need to consider on the left-hand side here on this chart, uh, the physical, technical uh, world, where you really have the emissions, where you have the energy consumption. Um, but uh, beside of these technical uh, drivers, um, where you have uh, more buildings, uh, building retrofits, etc., uh, you have on the, on the right-hand side, actually, the persons, the institutions that uh, take decisions that influence um, basically how uh, energy consumption and emissions are uh, developing over time. And uh, in cities specifically, you have um, next to the building owners, you have the, the voters, um, you have the city administration with their different boxes, you have asset holders, for instance, energy utilities, gas utilities that um, is a uh, can be a quite a, a substantial barrier uh, because it touches their uh, uh, usual uh, business model. And uh, you have uh, further uh, stakeholders such as investors uh, into the building sectors or also investors in uh, municipal energy uh, infrastructure. So what we need is a, a goal-oriented uh, still, of course, uh, but also strategic forward-looking and systemic uh, approach that uh, integrates all these uh, aspects. Um, typically, we'll start uh, with uh, creating a common ground uh, to bring together, to engage with the different actors that are uh, concerned in such a transformation process, uh, to agree on goals, uh, but also on procedures and on boundary conditions. Uh, that's a very important step before you even start of um, trying to uh, discuss uh, policy instruments um, that is in the second step then very important uh, to create a coherent storyline in the scenario uh, adoption technique um, to then simulate these uh, storylines that uh, the stakeholders were uh, agreeing upon and uh, to evaluate the impact of the different uh, uh, scenarios in terms of different indicators and in order to do so, uh, you typically first do some pre-studies to have uh, the data, uh, which is often uh, lacking. It can be uh, surveyed or uh, modeled. Uh, we, we have used uh, the urban building energy model at different scales, depending on the phase in the in the approach. Uh, so you, you need to be, you can be quite uh, rough in the beginning, but you go more granular as the the process evolves. And then to come up with a with an urban energy uh, plan uh, or concept, and uh, which is then the basis uh, to take uh, decisions on the on the fourth uh, box on this chart. <clears throat> um, and based on these decisions, uh, you need to start implementing uh, the plan. And uh, for this again, you need uh, the data. And uh, we were using uh, the, the similar um, approach uh, as we have been using it in the previous phases also to uh, support implementation. Uh, typically, you can also sketch it like in six different steps uh, where you start analyzing uh, the current situation, where you do uh, the strategic uh, approach uh, to see what is the feasibility and the impact of different policy instruments. Uh, along together with um, uh, systemic and uh, integral assessments of energy demand, energy efficiency, uh, and renewable energy potentials uh, that you need to uh, use uh, to tap actually to uh, heat and cool the buildings. Uh, you then decide on the strategic approach and on the instruments. Uh, so in municipalities, depending on the country's context, uh, uh, you, you might have a choice of instruments. Um, so you would um, take these decisions uh, on step four and uh, then on um, step five you would support implementation and uh, very important also uh, write 
start after uh, after or together with implementation the monitoring um, which would allow uh, to uh, adjust actually and go back to step one uh, if needed um, very important uh, is to involve all actors uh, so urban energy planners grid and network operators would have quite different views on the on the topic uh, but it's important to bring these uh, stakeholders together, uh, also building owners that have their buildings as, as a, an important asset. Uh, you have the, the uh, tenant associations that uh, should be involved uh, because they can either take advantage or uh, they can see themselves as uh, losers of such a pro process, which uh, should be avoided, uh, obviously. And um, so depending on, on, the, on the context, these different stakeholders are represented uh, by organizations or uh, you would uh, typically uh, also uh, in, include uh, uh, citizens uh, that represent uh, such uh, stakeholders, uh, for instance, if there is no tenants association. Um, so to uh, illustrate a bit uh, how we really did it, uh, you see uh, a framework of, um, of our tool uh, that uh, contains many modules uh, that uh, can be uh, applied uh, at even more uh, use cases, uh, starting from a very uh, strategic um, uh, level on the left-hand side uh, down to uh, even load shaping, grid redesign uh, issues. Uh, so if you want to uh, implement a large uh, scale or large shares of heat pumps uh, or PV systems, uh, then you have a, a great impact on the local grid and this uh, also should be uh, considered obviously. And by using uh, the same framework, which you can see on the bottom uh, of the slide, um, it's um, secured that uh, the uh, same um, evidence is the uh, same data, uh, the same um, assumptions is used across all these different use cases, which uh, uh, decisively increases uh, the acceptance uh, of, of such a tool. Uh, because uh, each, actors can, uh, each actor can also um, review the data and uh, feed in uh, knowledge and uh, evidence uh, to, uh, to the database and to the, to the methods uh, that are uh, used. Uh, we have um, implement or uh, applied uh, this this uh, tool uh, toolbox, if you want, um, in in Zurich and in other cases. Uh, so, uh, adopting a multi-phase approach that's uh, very important also to to note. Uh, you go from the pre-study uh, to the pre-evaluation at the strategic level. Uh, then, uh, obviously, uh, decisions need to be to be taken. Uh, that is uh, not us as a as a, as a consultant or researchers, but these are the real stakeholders that take decisions. And then after decisions were taken, uh, follows uh, the implementation. And uh, so the, um, this process allows in the, in, this, in the example of the city of Zurich, uh, uh, really uh, uh, the implementation and also the, the decision on, on um, large scale investments, uh, you can see on the, Third uh, chart from the top uh, that uh, the region within Zurich is are quite different. So that the sources of energy um, that are available locally uh, within the city are quite different. And uh, for, for some of them, you need uh, thermal grids to tap uh, energy resources uh, from incineration, from water purification, from the river, from the, from the lake, from geothermal uh, or groundwater uh, layers. And uh, uh, that's why you need need uh, also uh, investments on the municipal level, not only on the level of individual buildings. Uh, here we see uh, an example how it could be implemented, uh, example of Zurich uh, again. Uh, so as you can see, uh, you start with the defining uh, box on the left hand side and uh, you gradually uh, go to the right where you uh, discuss and prepare and uh, and, and refine implementation instruments, and uh, uh, which then uh, are um, a basis and also an interactive basis, by the way, uh, to the implementation process. Uh, very important is to uh, that you are aware that you need to have a leadership uh, that uh, is 
uh, steering the different uh, parts of, of the process and um, uh, obviously to really uh, implement, uh, make implementation real, you need the, the backup of, of either the population or the city council, uh, depending on, on, the, on the institutional framework of a, a given city. You might be interesting, uh, interested to um, learn more about uh, this, this approach. Uh, you can do so uh, by uh, reading uh, the German uh, contribution uh, that has been published in Springer. And if you don't read German, I'm happy to uh, send you an English trans translation of this article, uh, which I'm not, not allowed to share on, on the internet uh, due to copyright reasons. Uh, but if you write an email to Martin. Uh, Jacob at TEP uh, slash uh, energy dot ch, then uh, you will receive the, uh, receive the uh, uh, translation in English. Uh, thank you very much and I'm um, happy to answer uh, questions or maybe uh, Deborah Zuliger, who is also present on this meeting, uh, if you uh, have uh, any uh, inquiries and uh, she has a also good experience in implementing uh, municipal energy planning in uh, smaller uh, municipalities, uh, smaller than uh, Zurich. And uh, it's uh, actually, uh, to conclude, uh, important that you adjust uh, the approach, uh, the approach uh, on the size of, uh, of, the, of the city. Um, uh, obviously, large, uh, large scale cities uh, need a different approach than smaller municipalities. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, wish you a good uh, uh, further sessions. Thank you, Martin. That was really inspiring. And there's already the next question. I'm still a bit challenged with my monitors in here. That's why I'm looking from left to right. But um, maybe I start with the first question. Um, Martin, did your work include assessment of local network constraints, like local electricity grid or local district heating networks? Um, yeah, we haven't done uh, ourselves, but uh, we, we, with this uh, tool and model, we, we can provide the basis uh, uh, that uh, the other actors can do so. The utilities, for instance, uh, they're um, obviously concerned uh, if uh, in some neighborhoods, uh, heat pump uh, and uh, PV and now electromobility uh, are uh, coming into these uh, neighborhoods and um, they're assessing whether or not they need to uh, fortify, uh, to, to strengthen their uh, transformers, for instance, or their uh, parts of their grid. Uh, that, that's certainly an important part when it comes to implementation. And regarding uh, the thermal network, uh, we were so far mainly providing data on the uh, more conceptual, uh, more aggregate level with a focus on the demand side, which is actually our focus at TEP Energy. Uh, and uh, so network uh, grid calculation is then done by themselves or by other service providers. Thank you. I hope that um, answered the question. So Marcus, if there are no more questions on the chat, Maybe we have the time that I ask another question because I'm really inspired by your tool. Um, Mani, maybe you could give a very short answer because we are already running out of time. Um, so what do you think is, you, you talk about a tool and on implementation on the other side. So what do you think is the crucial aspect to close the gap, bet uh, the gap between common goals and common processes and common action? So how to come over to from, from plans to action to implementation? Yeah, of course, I would. I could say it's it's the tool, but uh, obviously that's not uh, not true. I mean, the the, the main challenge is really to bring uh, the different actors uh, to the table uh, to make roundtables, and uh, in in this uh, case of Zurich and also in other cases, the tool was just like a mean to bring the people together, and they were uh, the goal wasn't that they don't try uh, fight against numbers because everybody had their numbers. Uh, but they would agree on the, on the process, on the tools, on the data sets. We were processing the numbers and then uh, the, the discussion was more on really on the content and uh, yeah, the, 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 let's say the gas uh, suppliers would, would comprehend in the end of the day, they should uh, you know, convert their business. And uh, it took some time, of course, uh, but we could show them that there is no choice. Uh, 
uh, it, instead of doing something. And so the, the, the conclusion of them was to that they uh, enlarged their portfolio. Actually, they renamed the company. It's now called Energy 360 Degrees, uh, just to reflect that they should offer all types of energy. Thank you very much. Marcus, I saw you in between. Are there any further questions or any other things I missed? No, no further questions. Maybe just one question for me, but very short answer. Do you have some experiences with other cities than uh, Zurich or is this your, your the, 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 the only one? No, we are now working with a uh, utility actually, where it's a, still a different angle and we were doing this uh, on a more national uh, level uh, to consult the Swiss government on how to implement the energy strategy, uh, the new goal, uh, zero carbon, uh, and uh, with also uh, associations of renewable energy uh, to really have a, a, with a spatial focus uh, to see whether or not um, um, decarbonizing the, the building sector is feasible, uh, especially in the urban context. Uh, so we were looking at the whole Swiss case, uh, but still going building by building and to see which, uh, where is it more reasonable cost effective to have a grid and where is it more reasonable cost effective to have decentralized solutions. And then we could structure, you know, a, a, a more backed up uh, solution at, instead of just having very um, abstract uh, shares of yeah, put some renewables there and some heat pumps there. Uh, no, we really looked at all the, the buildings. Mm -hmm. And that's our goal now to, of course, disseminate this into other cities. Uh, we were providing data to city of Lucerne. Uh, we, we did the approach in the canton of Basel land. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, we have really uh, good plans to uh, implement this further on. We were spending too much time in making the, the model even more granular and we should now <laughs> go out. But EC3EE is one uh, opportunity to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Perfect, okay, thank you. Maybe we have some, some more minutes at the end. Um, so thank you so much, Martin and, and Deborah. Um, we now switch to um, and Markus, uh, you you made the perfect bridge for me. So from Zurich and Switzerland to the whole world, um, Kerry is going to address um, uh, the trans energy transition needs um, uh, worldwide, um, showing the results of a um, survey of the cities of global north and south. And um, she, they, they raised the question um, how um, uh, carbon reduction progresses have, um, how this process has changed during the last year um, and which challenges, options and changes during the COVID pandemic um, were brought to the cities in this context. So Kerry, we are looking for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to present my research today. On the implementation of net zero, low carbon commitments by cities, um, primarily during COVID-19. The rationale for this research is that cities are on the front line of climate action, both as drivers of global emissions, um, drivers of the majority of energy um, on which the world relied. Um, and also they are the, um, you know, the drivers of many of the solutions. Now, the origin of my research, it started during pa the Paris Agreement when there were hundreds um, of cities that, that committed to city climate action plans. And those city climate action plans had, had very ambitious targets at the time, um, and the trend continued where today we see several cities committing to net zero emissions. The questions that, um, that have arisen, um, but there hasn't been very much research about, is how is energy being addressed by these cities? Now, we know that the majority of cities do not have regulatory or budgetary authority over the grid or over grid decarbonization. We also know that net zero emissions, it will be impossible to reach net zero without massive grid decarbonization and energy transition plans. Um, the special report on 1.5 that the IPCC issued said that over 60% of the energy 
on which the world relies will need to be um, clean, um, powered by renewable sources by 2050 at, at the latest. So can we have a credible net zero commitment without having authority over the grid? Um, that's, that's a question, um, possibly an existential one, um, but one that, that I hope to answer in part in some of this urban research. In addition to the energy transition and um, dimension of, of this research, um, what I had planned to issue a survey and conduct a, a series of interviews that would dig into just that, um, just energy transition, how is it being addressed in city climate action plans, increasingly net zero. But as we as, as I had planned, the survey um, throughout 2019 and 2020, um, then of course the global plan pandemic hit and, and the experiences of city governments um, were, um, they wound up being on not only the front lines of, of climate emissions, but the front lines of COVID-19 response. The survey that I developed and launched also very much digs into whether COVID-19 um, affected or how um, it affected these energy transition commitments, um, these climate commitments, and what, you know, whether there were either delays or potentially whether green recovery plans and stimulus packages positively influenced the energy commitments and, and accelerated um, their ability for implementation. So in short, I issued the survey in January um, of this year, and it addresses three primary research questions. First, how are cities addressing and, and transitioning um, their grid or proposing to transition their grid? Um, when they, by and large, do not have budgetary or regulatory authority over the energy in which they consume. Secondly, re and relatedly, of course, is how is energy transition addressed in city low carbon or net zero commitments? And third, how has COVID-19 affected those pathways or those plans? The prime, I will primarily focus my research presentation today on the second and third question that you see on the screen. So as I distributed the survey, the objective ultimately, um, my objective is to obtain about 100 cities um, that respond. Um, what I would like is a geographic distribution um, equally, at, le at least equal um, in the global north and global south. Um, that represents both mega cities and secondary cities. Um, and what I would also like is at least 10 cities in three to four countries that are geographically representative and, and large economic centers. Um, so what I did in order to receive these, these responses, I distributed the, sur the survey through ICLA and C40 in terms of the global reach in order to reach the global breadth of mega cities and secondary cities that I would like. And then I, I um, did outreach to the national governments and municipal networks in three countries, um, US, Mexico, and South Africa. Um, I have thus far obtained 31 city responses. I've also received um, one state and two national government responses, which I will not discuss today, but I will likely um, analyze in, in my further research. So this slide shows the, the countries, nine countries where I have um, received city responses. The majority um, have been from Mexico, nine from Mexico, um, four from South Africa, six from the US, in addition to three from Kenya, three from Indonesia, and then one respectively from Sweden, Mozambique, and Argentina. As I mentioned, the majority of the cities surveyed um, are mega cities or secondary cities, so that's with a revenue budget of over 100 million per annum. Now, what I'll first do today is dig into 
the energy profiles and some of the data analysis of the cities that have participated. And then I'll outline the, the findings in terms of the renewable energy targets and COVID-19 and further research. So firstly, some of the energy profiles um, have results that I expected. The majority of transport and grid electricity profiles are not under municipal control, um, which is what, you know, the, what we expected, which is quite traditional, um, and, and what the, the 31 cities, the majority of the, that reported, did declare, as you can see on this slide. Similarly, as, as we do know, um, the majority, well, a, a good number of cities that participate in the, in the survey do have control over the energy in their built buildings and built environment. Um, this is also somewhat typical, um, and it is also why um, oftentimes you will see energy efficiency and buildings as a key component of city climate action plans. Now I'll delve into a bit of the targets. So the majority of cities that surveyed do not yet have a renewable energy target or a fossil fuel phase out target. Now this, this was somewhat surprising um, because especially with regards to renewable energy target, um, because there is so much focus on city climate action, um, you, you assume that when there is a focus on city climate action and when so many cities and several of them that participate in the survey are on, you know, are declaring at global conferences on UN platforms, et cetera, you would assume that um, renewable energy targets would be a central component. Um, it does not appear to be at least thus far that the majority of the cities participating in this survey have a renewable energy target yet. Similarly, explicit fossil fuel phase out commitments, um, the majority reported um, do not have those. This was less of a surprise to me, um, largely because cities really, I mean, it's, it's very difficult for them to influence a fossil fuel fa phase out makeup, um, with the exception of, of potentially having, you know, a bully pulpit um, roles or collaboration with cities. You know, state and federal governments, it is quite difficult to phase out from a municipal level. Now, something that is interesting and, and something that we will uh, you know, explore in more depth is that the cities with a net zero commitment, do the majority of those do include a renewable energy target. Now, it's, there are too few sample si the sample size is too small to be able to declare, you know, statistical significance quite yet. Or, um, but it is an interesting correlation and something that we will be exploring um, as, as we obtain um, more city results, um, whether there is a correlation. Um, and this, this would be quite important, um, especially because net zero commitments are requiring more of a robust reporting. Um, and and more and perhaps require more sophistication than commitments, you know, city climate action commitments during Paris, et cetera, when they were less sophisticated required. And so this this may mean that um, they will, you know, they they will look at energy transition and grid decarbonization in a more sophisticated way. That's my hypothesis and it's something that I will be exploring in more depth. Finally, where there are renewable energy targets, um, the cities that were surveyed thus far, they do cover multiple forms of energy and energy systems. So beyond the grid, including transport, buildings, fuel mixes, et cetera. And that makes a lot of sense, um, particularly given the jurisdictional boundaries that cities have. It makes sense that they look beyond um, the grid and look at the systems over which they do have control and develop targets and implementation plans for those systems. Now I'll delve into the impacts of COVID-19. Now, when going into this this survey. My hypothesis and the hypothesis of several I mean, of, of reports of the Secretary General's report issued last fall of 
COVID-19 impacts on cities of several news articles, et cetera, explaining the fiscal constraints and supply constraints of city governments. My expectation was that all city climate action plans and all renewable energy plans and, and investments were halted or delayed. Um, that, was, that was the result I was planning to see. Um, what I was surprised to see was that several city governments reported reporting, um, both in, in the global north and global south, so to speak, did not experience delays. Um, now, some did, of course, but it's not the majority, and that is that was quite interesting. So this further shows that you know about half of the cities surveyed face delays um, in their renewable energy investment projects, um, which again is fewer than expected. Interestingly as well, COVID in some cases has led to new financing and policy support um, for renewable energy commitments. Now that, that is also a, a finding that was surprising and, and interesting to see um, that green recovery plans and stimuli packages, stimulus packages um, did, did lead to positive impacts for renewable energy um, plans and, and climate change. And this slide further details that COVID-19 recovery and stimulus packages provided new policy frameworks to enable fossil fuel phase out. Um, and then you'll also see that job creation opportunities was another rationale that led new city governments to develop those plans. Um, so that is something that was interesting, surprising, and something that we will be digging into in further research. So the final slide on, on COVID-19 just shows nine cities on the global south that also declared that green recovery plans are helping to provide new policy frameworks for fossil fuel phase out what i found very interesting about this is that these nine cities are all in the global south um, primarily in countries that are high fossil fuel um, consumers and investors um, and and so this was quite interesting that they experienced that have thus experienced a very positive impact um, for fossil fuel phase out from green recovery. So finally, the findings. Now, some of the findings were not surprising. We know that the majority of cities do not have budgetary and regulatory control over fossil fuel phase out, over renewable energy transition, green decarbonization. And some of the findings that, um, that we have seen thus far do echo that. Um, at the same time, we do see that there are some robust renewable energy targets and there are some robust um, investments that cover multiple forms of energy beyond grid um, decarbonization. In addition, that net zero, those cities with net zero commitments do seem to have more sophisticated renewable energy plans um, than those without, which is, which is also an in interesting initial finding. Further initial findings re regarding COVID-19 show that about half the, of the cities thus far um, surveyed have experienced delays due to COVID-19, due to fiscal constraints, etc., cetera, um, which is fewer than expected. And several cities have experienced positive impacts from green recovery plans and stimulus bills. So for further research, what I, as mentioned, I, my plan is to continue with the survey distribution, dissemination, um, to reach approximately 100 cities in a geographically distributed um, um, number of cities, um, in addition to at least 10 cities in at least three countries so that I can analyze uh, a distribution within countries that are, you know, and be able to analyze you know, how they differ um, between, you know, between boundaries and inside, bound, inside national boundaries. Um, beyond that, I will dig into um, 
the interviews within cities and and we'll be conducting further analysis and qualitative interviews. My question to participants and fellow speakers is both related to survey distribution and also qualitative interviews. Do you have recommendations of cities or municipal city networks that you, to participate in the survey? Um, I would greatly appreciate recommendations and collaboration. And in addition, qualitative interviews, what questions do you recommend I focus on in, in my follow-up interviews? What would be most interesting to you? And what do you think is really critical for me to be able to answer my research questions? So I thank you for the opportunity. I look forward to collaborating and look forward to the question and answer section. Thank you very much, Carrie. I'm still a bit challenged with all the, the different, <laughs> different windows. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, we have already a, a question um, uh, on the chat from Ufa. Um, maybe we start with that. Carrie, as a result of your research so far, are you more or less optimistic about the role cities can play in the energy transition? Thank you, Susan. Um, it is an, a complicated question. Um, so I would say in terms of direct control over the grid decarbonization, I mean, cities have, have very little direct control. So um, in terms of, um, I would say, I'm not terribly optimistic if cities are going to take a very traditional um, approach to grid decarbonization. That said, and what, you know, what I do think is quite important is is the qualitative interview process. So after the you know after the survey um, is completed with with a larger share of cities participating, I think what will be very important is to inquire about the different indirect roles that cities play, and that that's where when I reference the bully pulpit role. Um, you know, you have you do have several anecdotal examples of cities such as New York, um, where when there are very um, strong mayors that have strong relationships with strong or or bully pulpit relationships with with governors that have more direct control, they can influence grid decarbonization and energy transition. So I think I think we need to find out more more about the different types of indirect powers. Um, but I would say, you know, from the initial surveys thus far, one, I mean, by and large, the the cities surveyed do not, you know, do not have robust renewable energy transition targets, um, and they, you know, self-reported do not have control. So I think, you know, in terms of optimism, I would say I'm not optimistic about traditional approaches to energy transition. Thank you very much. Marcus, Cedric, do you have questions from the audience or own questions? I, I, think, I think Martin wants to add something. You're still muted, Martin. Martin, so we cannot hear you so far. Martin, I think you're muted. OK. Uh, yeah, so just if, if there is some space for that, uh, so just to deepen a bit this, um, so from our experience, the cities, they would have a lever uh, a power of influence uh, through their utilities. Uh, so if, if the city owns the utilities, obviously, uh, if there at the same time was a political will uh, to really achieve the goal and maybe also to accept uh, some you know, economic, uh, let's say, drawback in sense of uh, nowadays uh, the gas suppliers, they they collect a lot of revenues and uh, a lot of in income revenues uh, for the city's budget. Uh, and of course, if for a phase of transition, this money should not be used for the city, but should be used for the transformation. This is a cost, uh, but they, they would have an influence as an owner to make an owner strategies. Uh, that's one options they had. Another option is a bit more creative, uh, perhaps uh, an economic instrument, what we, what we call the, uh, a target uh, specific concession. So you would allow uh, for a certain region, 
third party utilities even to come in or have a competition uh, and they uh, would be like the monopolists in this region if they uh, commit themselves to to reach a certain goal so minus x percent carbon by 2030 2035 uh, and then they can develop their ideas and try to uh, you know to to bring an offer and i think in uh, you know personally i come from the energy efficiency side of things and i was uh, attending energy ac triple conferences in the uh, in 2000 uh, and of course i was quite convinced on on energy efficiency and i think still think energy efficiency is very important but if you look at the buildings, urban context, in the end of the day, you need to bring in heat somewhere into these buildings or cool if, if, if in the climate. It's not only about electricity. And so there, if the city can manage to make an offer to the building owners, then they would, I think they would connect, you know, if the offer is quite, quite okay. Uh, but you need to have this, a decision and this uh, pre-investment uh, either by the public sector the private sector or 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 mixture of, of it and you need you need to be aware that in in a certain phase there's a is a price to pay that's a bit uh, you know if i look at different different cities uh not only them uh, to those that i, I was mentioning um yeah we should go more, just, in this more creative um, direction also. How can we bring in uh, private investment? And private investment is seeking, seeking for opportunities. They would say a municipal in, in, infrastructure, that's a great deal. You know, it's, uh, it's secure, it's long-term, and uh, uh, but it, it's often not, uh, the, the public sector is often not yet prepared to that, uh, to accept this kind of funding, for instance. Um, so, it's more to your issue, you know, it's a very <laughs> just to your point about the municipal-owned utilities, um, which I think is a, is is an excellent point. I mean, I think um, as you can see from the serve, you know, the cities that have thus far participated by, you know, there's only only one from Europe has has participated, and um, and in terms of cities that that own or or have control over or over their municipal utilities. Um, by and large, it's not, that's not the, the reality in the global south, right? So, so for the most part, I mean, it is a, it is a question that, um, that is in, in the, the survey and something that I hope that as, as more European cities report, we'll be able to analyze whether grid decarbonization per se, um, targets are more robust, more sophisticated, um, for cities that do have direct control over over their utilities, and the the cities that have participated thus far do not have that direct control because because it is a largely European reality. So um, so that is something I'm hoping as and and I do I do welcome any <laughs> any um, of the city's experts on um, you know participating today. I mean, if you do have cities or city networks that. Um, that you would recommend um, I distribute the survey to. I think that would be extremely helpful because I, I do, I have had um, much, much greater responses from the Global South, which in, in is actually, you know, is, is unique. And I think I'm, I'm quite happy about that um, in many ways, but it does not, it, it doesn't tackle that issue of municipal control over the utilities um, because that's, that's generally just not a reality. Um, so it's a great point, and it's something I'm hoping that we can we can dig up if we get more European cities participating. Thank you for that input, Martin. Carrie, there's another uh, remark on the chat. Maybe Cedric, you did that so well the last times. Could you just copy that to the chat so that Carrie has access to it? Because we are we are running out of time, and we have to skip to the next presentation. Thank you very much for that. So the next speaker is Iska. She will talk about social innovations in the energy sector, and she will introduce the initial results of a study examining the role of policy networks, key players, and influence on social innovations in the field. Iska, the floor is yours. We are curious for your findings. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today. My name is Iska Bronsema from Fraunhofer ISI in Karlsruhe. And I will presenting my colleagues and my work on policy networks and power relations. 
um, what determines the success of social innovation in energy within cities. First, I will be talking about social innovation and policy networks before briefly introducing the theoretical background we used for this paper. Then I will say a few words about uh, the methods uh, before presenting our results, which will then be further discussed. And last but not least, I will be uh, finishing the presentation with a few concluding remarks. Social innovation in energy transitions are crucial to the transformation of fossil fuel based energy systems toward energy systems based on renewable energy and energy efficiency strategies. Um, those rely not only on technological transformations, but on new concepts and relational processes which can affect behavior and roles of actors, meaning social innovation. Um, social innovation and energy transitions refer to the social dimensions of these energy transitions. They are new ways of thinking, doing and organizing energy. On the supply side, for example, there are energy cooperatives. Um, on the demand side, we know examples such as peer-to-peer -peer concepts, um, for example, community-based electricity or heat storing options. Or there's the concept of presumaging. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with presuming, producing and consuming energy and presuming, a uh, presumaging adds the dimension of managing energy. SIE have the potential to not only decrease energy demand, but also increase citizen engagement as well as acceptance for the energy transition and necessary measures to reach certain goals in these tra uh, transition processes. Local policy and changes in political objectives can promote or inhibit social innovations and are at the same time heavily reliant on the different stakeholders active in the field of SIE. Um, and while social innovations are explicitly promoted and well represented in local, national, international um, policies, also in EU level, um, SIE, meaning the energy aspect, is still far underrepresented. Um, surely energy cooperatives are often advocated for, but other kinds of initiatives or concepts such as collaborative, uh, collaborative eco-efficient housing or peer-to-peer -peer based concepts are hardly supported or um, not yet very visible. Considering this, cities differ quite substantially in their success to implement local measures for global challenges and SIE might play a crucial role therein. We examined SIE in the industrial city of Mannheim, where they are still emerging topics, um, as opposed to other cities with backgrounds of grassroots in initiatives, for example. In Mannheim, in central Germany, we uh, looked at the policy network around SIE. And first of all, what is a policy network? Social networks consist of nodes, in our case, the actors and the relationships between them. And a policy network forms around a specific policy issue, in our case, um, social innovation and energy transition. Um, policy networks are, a, are sets of relatively stable and non-hierarchical relations between interdependent actors. The network members are actors who can or want to influence political processes and outcomes concerning the issues. They are um, part of the public or political discourse and of the policy making uh, process. And all the while interaction between network members is not only based on cooperation, but also on conflict or competition. And since these relations between mem uh, members are based on this reciprocity and interdependence, Policy networks can be instruments for policy making. In this context, we studied how trust and power 
as forms of coordination influence the emergence of SIE in urban contexts and what determines their success? An important part of that question was which roles relevant actors play in the local policy network around SIE? These questions we uh, studied um, in the context of the Advocacy Coalition Framework, which was developed to better understand and explain policy processes and policy change. Uh, within this framework, it is assumed that in a policy network around a specific issue, SAE in our case, relevant actors form coalitions based on sh shared goals and beliefs. Those are considered the glue between members of a coalition to work together. And at the same time, trust and power are important forms of coordination. They can be beneficial for reaching a goal because one may gain better access to resources or more influence in the network. Also, similarities um, or dissimilarities may affect interact, uh, interaction between actors and their success in achieving their goals. Um, the study was uh, done in the central German city of Mannheim, which has an industrial background. There is still lots of industry and thus also high energy demand. Uh, furthermore, they still have a large co power plant, which is also the source for the heat grid. The local industry as well as surrounding cities are highly dependent from. Um, social innovations do play an important role economically as well as politically, but not in the context of energy or energy efficiency. Uh, furthermore, there are former military areas where the US Army was stationed. They are now conversion areas uh, which have a high potential for urban development, uh, new housing projects and as such for energy efficiency strategies. We used a mixed methods approach. Um, the first access to the field was gained through administrative actors who are part of the project. Uh, first, an online survey was used to gather network data, meaning other relevant stakeholders the respondents worked with and qualities and types of interactions between them. This approach also helped find new actors to contact for the study. Further data was gathered by the means of in-depth interviews. And very important for us was um, in order to prevent being affected too much by the bias, um, by the field actors, uh, field access through, um, through involved city actors, more actors were looked for in an online research. Overall, out of 23 contacted actors, 10 filled in the survey and 10 were interviewed. Eight were part of both groups, um, but two survey respondents didn't give interviews and two interviewees didn't fill in the survey. The interviews were uh, analysed uh, by means of qualitative content analysis and the network data was analysed using social network analysis. Um, different methods qu uh, quantitatively as well as qualitatively, meaning visually. Um, in Mannheim, 56 actors were identified in the policy network around SIEs, out of which 10 were interviewees and 46 were contacts named by said interviewees. They were mainly administrative actors, profit-oriented companies in the energy sector, NGOs, R&D um, actors, uh, networks and as associations. The network displays a typical centre-periphery structure, meaning um, there are lots of peripheral actors who are hardly connected to the rest of the network, mostly only by one other node, uh, while the centre is more dense, meaning there are more relations between these actors in there. Um, the node size in the picture here um, reflects on the centrality of the actors. Um, here, the in degree centrality was used, which is based on how often an actor was named by the other uh, other actors. This centrality indicates who connects the other network members and has 
the highest influence on distribution of interviews, uh, information in the network. Furthermore, a hierarchical cluster analysis based on the Euclidean uh, distance between the actors in the network was uh, done to find more relevant structures. And while two consisted only of peripheral actors and are less important, there is one very central group. They are here in orange and the black borders indicate that they were all interviewees. Um, this group is very well connected between members uh, as well as to the other groups. And furthermore, it connects to other groups that were found. Uh, here in pink, the group consists of players with a focus on social and sustainability topics. And the actors in light green have more of an energy and economic focus. These two groups are not directly linked to each other, but only through the central actors in orange. This structure highlights the importance of these actors and also shows a clear distinction between the topics of SI and energy. Furthermore, forms of coordination were studied in the policy network, and while shared beliefs didn't seem to matter much, trust was said to matter in the case of personal relationships because uh, this could be used to enhance opportunities of exerting influence in contexts where oneself was still lacking that influence. Power, meaning especially influence and access to resources, such as financial support, but also information and advice, was a clear indicator for cooperation. The combination of these, uh, these two meant, the combination of these two meant that the network was not well accessible, accessible from the outside, although administration tries to offer opportunities for that. Instead, cooperation often occurs between those who often work together and in beneficial connections, thus reinforcing already existing structures. Um, we could see that two separate policy subsystems around SI and energy um, exist and they are connected by a group of players central to SIE. Those are especially incumbents uh, in the energy sector and in the uh, local administration. Uh, the current power structures can inhibit the development of new uh, social innovation and energy transitions and especially of bottom-up processes. The incumbents perceive themselves as enablers and as multipliers but also have conflicting goals due to the city's industrial background and the high dependency on, uh, on fossil fuel and uh, energy um, up to now. And so they see themselves as the most innovative ones and as the most central ones to SIE, and they coordinate and organize top down, uh, while bottom up processes are not that well supported. Also, we could see that historically, SIE were not successful in the city, which may also be due to a low acceptance within this, uh, the citizenship. Um, there may be a possibility of change in the context of the German coal phase out, which is until 2038. Um, until then, all coal power plants will have to be shut down. And this will, this needs change. Um, energy efficiency strategy, strategies are more and more important and bottom-up processes and, um, and SIE may develop to, uh, to achieve those goals. Um, furthermore, administrative actors and incumbents have a key role and their perceptions of specific SIE affects whether or not they are successful. The clear concept, um, thus a clear concept is very important. Um, for the success of SIE. A comparative analysis between different cities will show whether or not our, um, uh, our results and, and insights reflect also in different backgrounds, um, not industry, for example. And we will see that in the future. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and if you have any questions, please ask away. Thank you very much, Iska. Um, 
As I haven't seen um, any questions so far on the chat, I would start uh, with a question which occurs to me. So um, you found that the players interact on the basis of power and trust structures, which prevents or at least hampers social innovations in the field. So as we are looking for, for new sustainable uh, transitions in cities, so what, what do you think is the way out? How can we enhance social innovations in cities, even if there's only one uh, case study so far? Luckily, this is only one of six. The others are still being analyzed, uh, <laughs> but we are getting there. Um, I, I think that this change of roles is really important. Uh, we talked in another context to um, a very important person in the other local context. Mm -hmm. He explained that they were always so powerful and they always controlled um, heavily what happened in the energy sector. Um, and he said they learned that they have to take in another role as an actual enabler, um, promoting bottom-up processes and enabling um, new initiatives, new organizations uh, to bring in new, in new ideas. And he said that in their city, they could observe how, um, how great of a change that can actually uh, generate. Thank you. Marco Cedric, have, are you having an eye on the chat? Maybe that brings us perfectly right back into our, our <laughs> to our timing. Thank you very much, Iska. And uh, then we switch to um, our last presentation. Um, our next speaker comes from University of California in the US. And he talks about the water energy nexus and lessons learned from a real life implementation with a housing project called Village Homes in Davis, California. Ricardo, the floor is yours. This documentary examines the importance of the land, water, and energy nexus in the design and development of the Village Homes neighborhood in the city of Davis, California. Village Homes was designed in the early 1970s by progressive thinkers, people who wanted to provide living interactions with natural systems, where almost half of the land area would be dedicated to building a multi-layered landscape dependent on rainwater to establish and sustain growth, understanding that the optimal capture of rainwater would be critical for sustainability, encouraging plant growth, enhancing soils, and recharging the groundwater basin. Adopting micro-catchment principles the landscape is contoured using cross slope swales and holding ponds to catch rainwater flowing from west to east and from south to north, optimizing the harvesting of rainwater and minimizing runoff from the system boundary while enhancing the water cycle, populating the open spaces with evergreen and deciduous plants and trees, ornamentals and fruit trees, vineyards, and dedicated community vegetable garden areas. Creating an edible landscape to produce fruits, vegetables, and eggs, reducing the food loss from the conversion of agricultural land for urban development. The planning department with the city of Davis was not convinced about the proposed rainwater storm collection and discharge system. The construction permit was granted after the city assessed an $800 per lot bond to cover liability risks if the proposed micro catchment system failed. The rainwater collection system worked so well that in the late 1970s, when there were heavy storms taxing the municipal storm discharge system, the city channeled excess storm water to flow 
towards the village homes landscape. Water scarcity conditions continue to prevail since 2011, having an impact on the land, water, and energy nexus. In 2015, the community drilled a groundwater 320 feet well to replace higher cost municipal water used for irrigating the landscape. Under water scarcity conditions, additional groundwater is used to supplement lower rainfall, increasing the water energy intensity of watering the landscape. Multiple efforts have been made to replace water intensive lawn areas with xeriscape principles, improving irrigation practices in vegetable gardens, orchards, and vineyards. Nonetheless, the 15 horsepower pump drawing 150 gallons per minute is not sufficient to irrigate the whole landscape, and further power will be required to extract additional gallons per minute if the landscape is to be fully irrigated with well water, increasing the water energy intensity to water a very mature landscape. Buildings are embedded in the landscape with contoured swales guiding the distribution of roads and construction sites to maintain gravity-driven rainwater flows. Building designs fit the landscape using solar passive building principles, capturing heat from the southern sun in the winter months, installing extra insulation to walls and ceilings, and creating transpiration roofs to limit the use of air conditioning. Allocating smaller lots encouraged smaller footprint dwellings that would demand less thermal and electric energy for heating and cooling. The small lot concept allowed for more land to not be under construction, thus making it available to develop a natural landscape, creating an essential value to living in the neighborhood where people would share and benefit from common landscaped areas, creating a value-added landscape premium for the community. The village homes experience has extended beyond the neighborhood boundary to influence city planning with progressive concepts where nature is understood as an important element of designing urban human spaces. Multiple efforts have been developed at the city level to create nature preserve stormwater retention ponds, green belts with walking and biking pathways, and containing city growth within a system boundary that limits impact on adjacent agricultural land. The West Pond creates a buffer zone for habitat development, attracting amphibious mammals and apes to the landscape. Multiple other nature development projects have taken place within the greater northern Sacramento River Basin, expanding an understanding of the critical role that nature has in providing sustainability to human endeavors. People participate in community through board of directors, architectural reviews, and landscape committees, creating standards with respect and tolerance, and the willingness to understand each other and regard for the environment. The parks and vegetable gardens provide outdoor space to engage in nature, sharing time with humans and animals. I had a conversation with Ms. Judy Corbett, co-founder of Village Homes, 
to provide historical context to the effort made to design and develop a sustainable community in the early 1970s. This uh, project came up and realtors looked at it. They thought it was for a bunch of hippies. They would tell people, you don't want to live there, you want to live over there. So we were the same price as other areas of, of the city and really people couldn't understand Right. Most people couldn't understand what we were doing. It was a little bit scary. Um, so I think we did well just to stay at, to sell out um, at, a, at a market price. And there was a slight recession at the time, and yet we did sell out the first unit within a year, 20 houses. So um, it was yeah. well that way it was about. But it was just so new. Yes. And it was in our imaginations, but and and the city council understood it. Um, they did. They did. That's a whole story, which is right like, critical for our success. And head of the yes. student body, president of the student body, and a few others who were in our college and graduate group who were really scared when we were learning what we were learning, and nobody else in the world seemed to understand this. And we got together with some people who were interested in politics and participating in the politics of the city and we put together something called the greater davis planning and research group which really laid out what we are today the emphasis on the bike paths and the urban limit line um, and the farmers market and the transportation um, and put forward what we call um, the greater davis plan and our, our member, Bob Black, ran um, as a council member, mm -hmm. and in the last two weeks, two other people affiliated with the university joined our plan and supported it. Three of them won. They understood what we were doing, <laughs> and us, and they we broke all the rules. I yes. mean, <laughs> wasn't, uh, there wasn't a single department in this city other than the city manager and the city attorney <laughs> who were supportive of it. Um, right. and it just We were just going back to the city council week after week, overruling the planning department and the <laughs> public works and fires. Right. And, um, the, and the fire department. And the fire department, everything. Mm -hmm. And um, and so it, <laughs> that's why it's kind of one of a kind. And I then realized that local government is going to be where decisions are made that we can make progress and better planning. Like Judy said, change occurs at the local level where stakeholders could agree that a whole system's perspective is needed to integrate nature within the living space, using the land, water, and energy nexus as a framework to advance community development efforts starting with the design of the land terrain, creating passive energy benefits, facilitating gravity flows for rainwater distribution and collection systems, to optimize water retention within the system boundary, recharging the groundwater basin, encouraging plant growth, providing roof and street shade, a viable carbon sink with lower footprint dwellings using passive and active renewable solar energy systems. It requires a common understanding among people to promote nature-based codes and standards where the common good benefits are priority to achieve desired outcomes without short-term monetary interest. Where the landscape premium of a village home's housing unit is reflected with higher real estate values among comparable houses, providing a longer term investment strategy where a present value can be estimated to reflect the landscape premium's life cycle benefits. The landscape premium includes direct water energy benefits derived from the micro catchment landscape design, capturing and retaining rainwater, landscaping with 
energy sufficiency principles and limiting rainwater discharge, reducing the cost of building on-site municipal stormwater discharge systems. Other indirect energy benefits are achieved when less stormwater is discharged on municipal treatment facilities, decreasing electricity demand while lowering the community's water energy intensity. The community is aware of the impact groundwater pumping has on aquifer recharge. Between 2018 through 2020, an average of 7 million gallons per year were pumped, representing about 34% of the volume of precipitation that was recharged to the aquifer during those years. Increasing the use of groundwater to irrigate more landscaped areas will continue to diminish aquifer recharge, leading to lower water tables with energy implications. Village homes should continue to identify water energy intensive areas where to reduce landscape water use and account for groundwater demand. The landscape design is unique in its capacity to capture precipitation to recharge the aquifer. It provides a model where local stakeholders, including water and power utility companies, could create incentives to adopt micro catchment urban housing principles, creating living spaces with edible landscapes recharging local aquifers. Thank you very much for that field trip, Ricardo. So th there is already a question on the chat. Um, so the question is regarding uh, the lessons learned uh, towards um, practical socially uh, in, in redesigning natural environment and, and for sure also on the pathway to sustainable cities. I apologize. Um, I was listening to you, and could you concise the question for me a little bit? Yes, sure. So um, you mentioned that um, for um, for the um, uh, the nexus that it will facilitate design and adoption of smart green codes and standards. That is also part of your um, your presentation. Can you say something about the lessons learned from your village homes project? Yes, you got very this much. Issue? thank you. I ap apologize. I've been awake since like three in the morning, so my brain is still. <laughs> um, I think the um, the lesson over the years uh, here in the city of Davis, after they gave the developers such a hard time um, to come forward with the project, and there were so many objections. Um, the city at this point is actually just recently gave the developers, the couple that Mike Corbett and Judy Corbett, uh, recognition for uh, 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 an environmental um, award, if you will, uh, to recognize the work that they've done and what this uh, neighborhood now means as an example. Um, so I think that there is this long-term uh, awareness uh, that now we would be much more receptive, um, at least us, the end users of these living spaces, uh, hoping that we would have the political will uh, at the local level where the, um, the um, building departments would uh, incorporate uh, these codes and these standards that are not standard, <laughs> uh, because it really requires thinking outside the box and trusting that nature can actually be um, uh, integrated within the living spaces. Uh, so I think that that is part of the transformation of the human effort to understand how to live differently. Thank you very much. So are there, are there any other questions toward to, to Ricardo at that moment? 
Um, just to remind you, Iska, there's another question, but I think if we open that up, it will, um, yeah, it will um, go beyond our uh, our our time frame. So, um, if there are no more questions towards Ricardo directly, let me try to sum up what we've heard during the last ninety minutes. So, uh, we're in a session of goals and pathways towards sustainable cities, and. Uh, Ricardo just mentioned it. It's a, it's a matter of thinking out of the box, and I think that is that is how we can sum up um, what we heard. We need a new thinking. Um, and Martin and Iska um, talked about new thinking in stakeholders and stakeholder roles and bringing in private and um, public stakeholders together and defining new new functions and new roles in that. And it's also a, a new thinking in cross silo thinking like um, uh, like Carrie um, showed us and um, like she, she mentioned that it's not only a disbalance between goals and uh, ambitions and implementation, but also uh, during the, the pandemic, there have been uh, new positive trends in, 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 in reconnecting uh, different silos and bringing up new policies and new options. And what Ricardo um, closed up the session is the um, the, the third um, third thing next to stakeholders and the cross silo thing is that we need implementation that we need to have um, yeah like field trips and going there and feeling and trying if it really works is also like the project Martin mentioned so we really need to do that the tool is not enough we really need to do that and experience that it works and that it that's a matter of um, communication and a matter of doing in order to come to a successful and implementation. So let me thank you once again for these inspiring talks uh, we heard so far for the first session. Um, thank you also for, for our audience for the interesting questions. And um, yes, let me uh, invite you to, to our next um, panel session tomorrow morning at 1030. I have to look on my on my, so it's it's the role of municipalities as path makers to sustainability tomorrow at 10 30. Um, and yes, we are looking forward to welcoming you all again. And yes, thank you for all your contributions and have a nice afternoon. You're welcome. See you tomorrow.